Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on the legislative attacks on NEPA and other laws important to pipelines, led by Stephen Shima, the NEPA Campaign Director for Save Our Environment, and Raul Garcia, the Associated Legislative Counsel for Earth Justice. My name is Bridget Brady, and I'm an assistant to Maya at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. I think that most of you are aware of who we are, for, but, but for those of you who are new, Maya Van Rossum is the Delaware Riverkeeper, and she leads the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, a nonprofit working throughout the entire Delaware River watershed on the issues, actions, regulations, legislation, policies, programs, and decisions that impact the health of our Delaware River watershed and our ability to protect and restore them for the benefit of all. We work on a lot of shale gas pipeline projects at DRN. Um, we're currently working on and opposing over a dozen new pipeline or expansion projects within our watershed. And we also do a lot of work at DRN and collaboratively with other organizations to collectively fight against the proliferation of pipelines across the country through both state and federal strategies. Tonight's webinar is the first in a new series that the Delaware Riverkeeper Network is hosting on the most effective strategies and tools for communities working to defeat shale gas infrastructure. The concept for the series came out of a collaborative discussion with other community organizations and legal thinkers working on these issues, including Stephen and Raul. The goal of the series is to share some of the most effective strategies being used to defeat pipelines and other infrastructure infrastructure projects by some of the leaders working to fight shale gas infrastructure projects through their advocacy, legal, political, and economic expertise with those fighting these battles in their community. The idea is to provide the best tools and information that people can use at the state and federal level to, to defeat each of the individual projects that we're all facing across the country while also strengthening the larger collective battle against FERC and Natural Gas Act reform. There are going to be five more webinars after tonight. Um, on April 18th, sorry, we'll be, the topic will be clean water, the Clean Water Act uh, Section 401 certification, and that will be led by Aaron Stempelwitz of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. On April 25th, the topic will be the economic impacts of pipelines um, and the arguments that FERC misses and that we must raise. That will be led by Spencer Phillips and Sonia Wang of Key Log Economics. On May 23rd, there will be a second edition of tonight's webinar, along with any new updates that come along in the meantime. And on June 20th, the topic will be the Clean Air Act and will be led by Nadia Steinzer and Aaron Mintes of Earthworks. And finally, on July 11th, the topic will be climate change and CEQ regulations led by Maya, Stephen, and Raul from tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen and Raul in a moment, but I wanted to go over a couple house, housekeeping points quickly first. Um, the webinar will last about an hour and we're going to try our best to honor that time period. We will have a question and answer session after Stephen and Raul's present presentation. Please direct any questions to Stephen and Raul while we have this time with them. And if we have too many questions and run out of time before we get to all of them, we apologize up front. If you have a question come up during the webinar, please just submit it through the text box as you think of it. And then I will pose the questions to Stephen and Raul at the end and allow them to answer. We are not going to be opening up the phone lines for people to ask questions directly, so please just queue them up as they come up to you during the presentation. And we're hoping to have a recording of tonight's webinar to share in the near future, and we'll send that along in a follow-up email shortly after tonight's webinar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen and Raul. Thanks, Bridget. And can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So thanks to Bridget and thanks to Maya and everyone at Delaware Riverkeeper who made this possible and for drawing attention to this important but often overlooked issue, which is the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, my name is Stephen. I work at the Partnership Project. We 
The Partnership Project is a national coalition of about 35 national environmental groups. We work on core issues that affect all of our groups, and one of them is NEPA, and I direct the NEPA campaign. Raul works at Earth Justice, and I'll let him introduce himself. But Raul and I have been working on this issue for the last few years, uh, defending NEPA against legislative attacks, uh, defending the National Environmental Policy Act. And what we're trying to do is preserve public input and environmental review under the law. And if you've been tracking Congress <laughs> for the last few years, and I'm sorry, my voice is getting hoarse, but hopefully I won't lose it. Uh, if you've been tracking Congress, and I don't suggest you do this if you enjoy your sanity, uh, this last few years have been one of the most aggressive attacks on citizen participation and environmental regulation of public health, safety, and the environment in history. And this is getting lost in the noise of current, of the current political landscape, and unfortunately it gets ignored even by some of our allies uh, in the Democratic Party because there's so many other things going on. But what is going on is, you know, this is about disempowerment. And this is, you know, this, the attacks on NEPA are part and parcel to some of the attacks we've seen in other areas, like on um, voting rights and things like that. So, you know, before we dive into the legislative attacks, I do want to just give a, a thumbnail sketch of what NEPA is. And, you know, at its core, NEPA is about public input and environmental review. NEPA is a model law it's one of the most imitated laws, American laws, we have internationally. I think over 100 countries have adopted similar legislation, uh, which is part of the reason it's often referred to as the Magna Carta of environmental laws. It was the first passed in 1970 by Richard Nixon and overwhelmingly bipartisan, which is hard to imagine now. But it's also one of the most widely misunderstood laws and underappreciated laws because people just don't know that they're using it. So... Uh, like I said, I'm going to give a thumbnail sketch of what NEPA is, but uh, if you have questions, we can answer them at the end. But NEPA is about three main things, and the first I mentioned is environmental review. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act integrates environmental decision-making and values into federal decision. Uh, it looks at not only the environmental impacts of projects, federal projects, but also the health impacts and the economic impacts. It's a decision-making tool that's supposed to guide federal agencies when spending taxpayer dollars. The law is also about disclosure. It provides critical information uh, to the public, and it's disclosing these environmental impacts and social impacts and cultural impacts to communities so that they know exactly what's going to happen um, in their neighborhood, in their communities. And finally, most importantly, it's about public input. And NEPA is one of the few laws that actually requires the federal government to consult, consult the public, and it gives several opportunities by law to stakeholders, to citizens who are affected by government action to weigh in on that decision. And the important part is, and I should add a fourth here, uh, is accountability. NEPA is one of the few laws that allows citizens to hold the government accountable, too, for ignoring them. And so it's often a litigation hook if uh, a federal agency ignores certain impacts, ignores public input. NEPA has recourse under the Administrative Procedure Act. It's important to keep these you know, four key components of NEPA in mind as we start talking about legislation because it's all of these components that are under attack. But before we do, it's good to just get a basic overview of what the environmental review process looks like. And essentially, there's three types of environmental review. And the first one is categorical exclusions. These are uh, it's the minimal amount of, of environmental review. And these aren't exemptions or waivers of environmental review. And that's important to know. Uh, it's a class of actions that are a category of actions which don't individually or cumulatively have a significant effect. And this is reserved for activities uh, on the basis of past experience of the agency that they've reviewed before and they don't have a significant impact. And this is meant for routine activities like changing light bulbs, uh, sweeping parking lots, or small-scale building repairs, not for, you know, big significant projects. The second type of review is an environmental assessment. And this is essentially a kind of preliminary review that an agency does 
when they're not sure if there's going to be a significant impact. And if as a result of that review they determine there is, then that's when you do a full-blown environmental impact statement. And this is what many of you may be familiar with if you're familiar with NEPA, is this is the review that requires a, a full-scale examination of the project impacts, and it also requires the agency to consult with the public. And uh, it requires the agency to disclose the impacts to the public. So this is what we see and what you know Delaware Riverkeeper has used for a lot of the pipelines and it successfully engaged the process uh, during the consideration of the building of these pipelines. So right now what we're seeing is a really full scale assault over the last four years on NEPA. And over the last four years there's been uh, 150 laws that, or 150 pieces of legislation, not laws, thankfully, that have been introduced that are targeting NEPA. And this is a really persistent, steady attack. You know, that's a couple bills every month for the last four years. Uh, these range from broadside attacks on the law to more project-specific exemptions. And project-specific exemptions are the primary means by which this law is attacked. Uh, Instead of taking the statute on head on, and we'll talk about this more, uh, members of Congress have recognized that people actually like to have an opportunity to engage decision makers, to engage decisions that are going to affect their community. So they do these more discreet attacks. And it may be for a specific pipeline project. It may be for a specific timber cut. It may be for a specific highway they're going to build. They'll target NEPA and limit environmental review or limit public input or limit judicial review. And they've been using this approach pretty consistently. And there's a reason for that, which I'll discuss later. But already this Congress, we've seen over a dozen bills. And some of these have been introduced in previous uh, congressional sessions. But we expect quite a few more, if not more than the, the last session and uh, the previous combined. And before we talk about this legislation, it's important to think about what is the goal of what's going on right now. And you know, we've always suspected that there's certain members of, of Congress that since they want to do away with environmental regulation generally, that it stands in the way of uh, project development and stands in the way of industry and jobs. And we know that's a, that's a false narrative. But nevertheless, we also know that they are trying to simply eliminate this law. And recently, uh, the Heritage Foundation has actually been leading this effort. And they obviously aren't necessarily a proxy for members of Congress, but um, they've been pretty effective in lobbying on this issue. And the Heritage Foundation in 2012 actually called for the complete decision of NEPA. They just want to revoke the law. And that was actually doubled down just this month uh, the Heritage Foundation testified at a hearing on March 1st. And again, they said, you know, rescission of NEPA is the main goal. And part of this is, you know, the idea is since we can't rescind it entirely, let's narrow the scope of uh, the review process and narrow the ability of the public to weigh in and prevent the ability of the federal government to look at climate impacts of federal projects. And that's particularly disconcerting when it comes to pipelines. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But uh, as I was saying, they recognize that they can't take the statute head on. And so they actually laid out a blueprint. And the disturbing part of this is this blueprint is being followed. And I mentioned 150 pieces of legislation. They all take this approach. And what they do in discrete circumstances is they'll chip away at the law. And it's a death by a thousand cuts way to eventually repeal the law or rescind it. And what we're seeing is the narrowing of NEPA reviews, either by narrowing the scope of what may be considered, uh, putting really arbitrary and short time limits on projects that are, uh, require more time. Uh, they're limiting alternatives. And alternatives are what are often described as the heart of the NEPA process. This is when an agency will consider uh, an alternative to the proposed project that may accomplish the same means. And so, you know, if you're building a highway, maybe an alternative should be public transportation instead of doubling down on cars. 
Uh, another thing that they want to get rid of, and this is what we've seen in multiple pieces of legislation, is to eliminate the consideration of greenhouse gases. And like I said, we've seen these in almost every bill that has come up. But just this year, uh, President Trump said, generally speaking, we will be giving you your permits. And he said this on January 24th, which is no coincidence, because this was on the same day that he issued an executive order. And that executive order is uh, number 13755, for those who want to look it up. But it's titled Expediting Environmental Reviews and Approvals for High Priority Infrastructure Projects. And the executive order generally calls for the White House Council on Environmental Quality, which is in charge of um, overseeing the implementation of NEPA. It charges CEQ to expedite these high priority projects. And these are things like bridges and highways, the grid, and also pipelines. And it calls for deadlines. And deadlines are, are something that uh, have often been abused in the past, and we're seeing a lot more clamor for it now. Fortunately, there's not a lot of teeth to this executive order, but the message is clear. And the message is, we are just going to fast track and approve projects regardless of the environmental impacts and regardless of public input. It becomes, the entire NEPA process becomes something of a check the box exercise, which is what we want to avoid. So going forward, we expect this to get worse, and we expect more executive orders. In fact, just this week, we're expecting to see an executive order from President Trump on climate. And there will be much to loathe in this executive order in terms of repealing uh, the Clean Power Plan and other efforts that the Obama administration put in place to act on climate change. They're also going to revoke the greenhouse gas guidance for how to incorporate climate change considerations into environmental reviews. This guidance was issued last August, and it's a really positive, significant step that we've been waiting for for nearly a decade. And it was issued in August, and now it looks like President Trump is going to revoke that. And again, it's the same message of just approving projects regardless of their impacts. And with the, regard to this executive order, at least the drafts we've seen so far, uh, it looks like they're sending a message to the federal government when preparing to spend what has been talked about as a $1 trillion infrastructure package. And that's $1 trillion taxpayer dollars for bridges and roads and critical infrastructure like the grid. Uh, they want to tell agencies to ignore the impacts of climate change and to ignore the impacts of federal projects on the climate. And this is a really dangerous precedent, obviously, since, you know, climate change threatens our critical infrastructure. And if we start building infrastructure that is not uh, responsive or resilient to extreme weather, whether it be droughts or storms or things like that, we're really putting the public at risk. So we're expecting that sometime this week. Um, the good news is I don't think it changes the underlying law, which uh, agencies and courts have long uh, considered climate change to be exactly the type of environmental impact that agencies should be considering. And nevertheless, revoking the guidance will send a strong message for, for agencies to uh, cut corners in this area. We're also expecting uh, other avenues for where bills can be attached or riders can be attached to that would uh, attack NEPA. And one of these is upcoming budget fight, which, uh, you know, as soon as the end of April, we're going to be coming up on a deadline. And when you have these big bills, like a must-pass thing, like uh, a budget, a number of things, a number of riders will get attached. And when these negotiations happen, at least over the last four years, NEPA has been a low-hanging fruit in negotiations. And when there's horse trading going on, uh, it's often the case that something will chip away at NEPA. And as an example, uh, and a couple of years ago, we had a farm bill, which was a must-pass bill. It was a big bill. Everybody wanted it passed. And the bill was held hostage for some riders. And one of them was a, a waiver of NEPA for timber cuts, so long as the timber cut was under 3,000 acres which may sound benign, but 
we've just seen recently that that waiver has been used to cut close to 74,000 acres, and that waiver uh, project sponsors have applied to use that waiver on over 50 million acres. So, you know, these riders add up, and they can cause lasting damage. And then, as I was mentioning, we'll see a lot of bills attacking NEPA in discrete circumstances. And I want to talk about a few of those and some that we anticipate because uh, they're likely to come up, and if not in the exact same form, in a similar form. And one of these was in the 114th Congress. That was last, the last congressional session. And this was the Natural Gas Gathering Enhancement Act. It was Senate Bill 411. And this actually completely eliminated input and environmental review under NEPA exactly when you want it most, when they're looking at these gas gathering lines and compressor stations, which we know uh, carry extreme risks. And those, this can be contamination, explosion, air pollution, property damage, public safety. You know, there's a whole host of concerns. And uh, this bill aims to get rid of considering those impacts and considering those risks to local communities. Uh, Another bill on the House side was the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act. This was introduced to the last few Congresses. Um, and this would, again, put time limits. This is something we talked about before. Uh, it would limit the amount of time for CAD to consider an application to one year. And then for other laws, like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, uh, that would have a three-month review process. And if these deadlines aren't met, then the permit's approved. And this is something we also see a lot, is they'll put in place a deadline on an environmental review or a permit. And if that deadline isn't met, despite whatever the impacts may be, if the agency thinks that the further review is, is necessary, if the agency thinks there's a, a danger to a local community, they, they can't take any more time, the project will just be approved regardless. And we expect to see that kind of language in a number of other bills. And previously, in the 114th Congress and the 113th Congress, when we saw these 150 bills, we could count on the fact that bills would pass the House, maybe, and maybe they would even pass the Senate. And the Senate was usually one of the, the backstops we had. But even if it got past that, uh, the Obama administration uh, could veto those bills. And now, with the Republican-controlled Congress, House and Senate, and the White House were really at risk of letting some of these bills pass. And as many of you know, at least in you know, the environmental uh, activism area, you know, all of our wins seem kind of short-term, but our losses are permanent. You know, we don't get these things back. And so we really have to be careful and watch a lot of these bills. And you know, the pipeline bills, it's easy to recognize the threat and the, the more pernicious attempts are the ones where people aren't paying attention. And that may be in, you know, highways or the Department of Energy or a small conduit hydropower. All these little bills add up. And once members get on record of supporting these kind of changes and these kind of limitations on environmental review or public input, it becomes easier to move it over to other areas. And that's what we've seen over the last several years. Um, a big bill passed four years ago. It was a transportation bill, and that had historic rollbacks of the ability of the public to engage in the decision-making process under NEPA. That bill passed in 2012. Uh, we then saw all of those provisions extended to Army Corps of Engineer projects, which the Army Corps of Engineer does dams and huge, massive projects. And those rollbacks were extended to that area. And now we're seeing the same language pushed into other areas. And it all starts in something that most people weren't watching. So we expect to see that similar approach taken. And it was extended into the energy bill. And I'm flagging this because it came up last year. And it looks like provisions in that bill are going to come up again this year from what we've heard. And in that bill, there were quite a few provisions that would roll back uh, judicial review that would roll back uh, environmental review or public input. But specifically, there were some related to pipelines and gas projects. And in that area, there were deadlines imposed 
Uh, FERC was designated as the lead agency, and there was mandatory deference to FERC on the scope of environmental review. And usually the public should be allowed to weigh in on what the scope of environmental review should be. But again, they're trying to, you know, press the thumb on the scale of the review process to just get it approved. And we saw this even more recently with the Federal Permanent Improvement Act. And this sounds really wonky, but uh, it's worth paying attention to because this was tucked into the last transportation bill. And as I mentioned earlier, there's these big must-pass bills that often get introduced, and then they add all these kind of uh, really toxic riders. And this bill, which is included in the transportation bill, uh, created this whole separate permitting regime for uh, high priority projects. And it was high priority infrastructure projects. And these were projects that are over $200 million, and it could include infrastructure as broadly defined. It can be conventional energy production, it can be highways, it can be waterways, it could be pipelines and manufacturing. And this catch-all phrase in the bill allowed the permitting council to add in any other project that might benefit from the abbreviated review. And the provisions in that, that review that they created, this review process that they created, which is kind of parallel to NEPA, uh, and it's within the NEPA process, they limited the public participation under NEPA. They allowed the adoption of state environmental review documents, which most states don't have a NEPA-type law. And even if they do, it's not nearly as robust. It doesn't allow for the same type of public input or the same type of engagement. The bill also limited judicial review. And this is something that we're seeing time and time again is trying to limit the ability of citizens to hold their government accountable. And here they limited the statute of limitations by four years. It used to be six, now it's two. It placed limitations on which parties may file a claim. And then it made it even more difficult for plaintiffs to obtain an injunction, an injunction would stop a project if that project had not followed the law. And now it's going to be more difficult to stop these projects even if it's clear that the agency had uh, ignored responsibilities. And it's a good idea to keep an eye on this bill because it's already law and it sunsets in a few years, but right now there's a lot of projects that are being considered under it, including pipelines. Right now, there's nine pipelines that are being considered by FERC that are under this permitting dashboard. They're being considered under this Federal Permit Improvement Act. You can go to a website, and I don't think I have the link here, but I can send it around after if people are interested, and it lists all the projects around the country that are uh, fallen under this umbrella of high priority projects that will get abbreviated review. Uh, they're color coded, but You'll note that there's the FAST 41 projects, which is the Federal Funding and Improvement Act projects, and then there's the Department of Transportation projects, which also get an abbreviated review. So, you know, that should give a good impression of, you know, just how far-ranging and impactful these changes are. You know, that these are really, really uh, costly and complex projects with the potential for severe impacts and we're risking, if any other legislation gets through, that there's just going to be even less review. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Raul now so he can talk about uh, what we can do to resist these efforts. And then I'll answer any questions at the, at the end. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, so this is Raul Garcia, uh, Legislative Counsel at Earth Justice. Um, so for a while, um, you know, we've been sort of looking at this picture, right? And and uh, <laughs> no offense, Stephen, but it, it seemed kind of bleak. Um, sort of, how are we going to react to this? And it seems like every time this one of these must-pass legislations makes it through, it carries some sort of waiver, right? And so um, there is a, you know, we knew that there needed to be a shift. The law has been around since 1970. Uh, and it had been valued for decades. And now, since the mid-2000s, we, um, we have sort of uh, seen this attack, you know, all of these attacks coming our way. So, you know, one thing that, uh, from a cheesy uh, TV show that I really like, uh, there's a House of Cards, many of you might be familiar with it, but 
there's a quote that's something to the effect of, if you don't like the way the table set, turn over the table. For a, what I mean by this, and, and the reason why I put it up there, is that for a really long time, we've been biting into this nar narrative that NEPA is a source of delay, that NEPA stops develop, uh, development, and that it's only a way to stop projects and that it's just, even from our camp, right, we, we hear all the time, well, NEPA is just a procedural law. It doesn't really have teeth. And we, uh, as the environmental community is concerned, we sort of bit into that, that, that uh, hook, and we never got out of it. We kept talking about how NEPA is not the source of delay and how NEPA is not just a tool to stop development uh, with litigation. And no, NEPA is not just a procedural tool. Um, and so we were caught just reacting to the to the stuff that we were hearing, and we actually weren't actually we weren't talking about the positives that NEPA actually brings to communities themselves. And so that's something that we've been trying to change as of late. So what do we need to do? We need to construct a NEPA defense structure on our terms. What is the value of NEPA to us? How is it po how is it actually used? Um, and, and, and Stephen alluded to many of these things before, right? NEPA is really a tool for informed decision making and transparency and accountability. Um, actually, when it comes down to it, it actually saves time and money. It doesn't cost time and money to do it. Um, and, and really, having collaboration in, in project development is key, right? Because it actually makes projects better because you're hearing from local experts. And, uh, and it makes them more popular because everybody has a buy-in. However, what I would argue is the most important aspect of NEPA is the public input angle to all of this. What's cool about this, and what's cool especially for folks that are on the ground, grassroots, that have to live with the consequences of this, is that NEPA is not a tool for a big green organization can co to come and tell you how to use it. NEPA doesn't say you actually have to care about the environment, or NEPA doesn't say you actually have to care about in your backyards and all of that. NEPA is actually a tool for people on the ground to voice their own opinions and priorities. We think it's important not just because it largely reflects our own values in terms of, hey, we should look out for the environment, but because it allows people on the ground to be able to say, hey, I need a say in this process because this is what I care about. And what you may care about might not be the environment. You can use NEPA to fight for civil rights. You can use NEPA to fight for um, uh, uh, health care for veterans, health care in federal prisons, health care in immigration detention centers. And so that's one cool thing, is that we care about the environment and we use it for that. But NEPA is really a tool for the, for the communities themselves to use according to their own priorities. That's something that's largely been lost as of late. Um, and so we've been trying to change the narrative, right? And, and, and we say we, but, but really what, what does that mean? Um, and, and we means that so far it's been the big green community, right? Your Earth Justices, your Sierra Clubs, your uh, NRDCs, your uh, Defenders of Wildlife. But we need to start talking about how, the, how NEPA actually affects people on the ground, the people who have to live with the consequences of these projects, and not just from the perspective of a big national organization. And so we're starting to do that by partnering with people even outside of the, of the green space, right? So we've gotten a lot of interest from, uh, for, as of late, the Latino community in, in trying to fight for conditions within immigration detention centers. And we've gotten a lot of interest from communities fighting, um, you know, communities of ranchers or communities of landowners and farmers who, who typically wouldn't swing our way. You know, they, they might not be all into the environment, but they care about their communities, and that's something that they want to protect. And so those are really the messages that we need to hear. Uh, we need to hear, we, you know, for a long time, we, we said, well, let's think about NEPA success stories. And the way we would talk about NEPA success stories is, well, there was this parkway that they were, or there was this highway that they were going to build, and they built it into a parkway. And there was this bike lane that got added to this Route 66 in Washington, D.C. 
And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with those issues. But it, it, they're not enough to move a vote in Congress. That's just the bottom line, right? So what is enough to move a vote in Congress? Now it's health and safety. Uh, I'll give you one example, right? And, and, you know, and I think it strikes to the heart of this, because we saw this with pipelines, right? We saw this in the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I know that recently we've seen some setbacks in that, largely to Trump's, um, I, I just can't call him President Trump, but um, to Trump's uh, initiatives on pipelines. But so we've seen those setbacks, but NEPA as it originally used served a tremendous purpose there to actually empower the, the, the tribal communities uh, in the Dakotas to be able to say, this is not something we want on our land. And the issue wasn't about, well, it doesn't look pretty, or, it, you know, or we can maybe spice it up a little bit. No, the issue was it will impact our drinking water. We cannot, you, you, we cannot be drinking oil and gas and whatever is going to be going through this uh, pipeline. We actually need clean water for our survival. Those things make people take notice. Those things can actually bring people to change their votes in Congress. And so we need to hear those stories. The people on the ground that are listening, we need to hear from you. And I understand that this is sometimes difficult because what we hear a lot of is, well, I went to that town hall a while ago, uh, you know, and, and that participated and, and that was cool. Uh, or I submitted comments in this public comment period that happened, but I don't really know what happened to it. And all of those things, all those things that we talk about, that's warranted by NEPA. So if NEPA doesn't exist, hey, guess what? Those public comment periods don't exist. And if NEPA doesn't exist, those public town hall hearings actually don't exist either. And so we need to hear from folks that have gone to these hearings, that have seen positive effects when they're being listened to, and the negative effects when they're not being listened to um, in these areas, right? And so as I mentioned before, we have enough of the big greens on this stuff, right? Our perspective has been heard for over 30 years that NEPA has been around. We need to hear from folks on the ground that can point us in the direction of real impacts that NEPA is having on their communities. And so a lot of times I, I like to joke around, right? So I, 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 I lobby Congress on a, lot, on a lot of things, primarily NEPA defense, right? But I like to joke around that before I walk into an uh, before I walk into a, a hill meeting, most of the time the staffers for the co for the congressional uh, members and the senators already know about 90% of what I'm about to say to them. They know Earth Justice. They know our track record. We know we stand behind NEPA. That's fine, but that's not news, right? So it's harder to get them to ch change their vote. So how do we actually change their vote? We change their vote by bringing people that they care about and have them talk about NEPA, right? So it's not the environmentalists coming to talk about NEPA, but it's, you know, if we're in an office that has a large uh, farming community, if we bring in farmers from that community and the farmers care about NEPA and they say how NEPA is important to them, that'll strike at the heart of the representative or the senator a lot more than me coming in with talking points. Why? Because it's a genuine story, right? We need to stop thinking of lobbying as, especially on NEPA defense, as this thing that uh, people in suits do up on Capitol Hill. We need to start thinking of lobbying as how do we tell our own personal stories uh, in a way that show how NEPA is important to us and how it's been used and, and even how it can be improved. Uh, you know, there's nothing to say that that's not in the conversation either. And so, as I mentioned, when we've been partnering with Latino organizations and civil rights organizations uh, lately on, on NEPA defense, and we've gone to, um, to offices on the Hill, they, they don't care much about what environmentals have to say about it, but they sure care about what the Latino community has to say about NEPA, right? So they listen to them, and we have seen change. We have seen change from leadership in Congress about how they approach the issue and how they're talking about the issue. So we just need to continue that and build the coalitions bigger and bigger. Because there are folks in Congress, believe it or not, 
who don't care either what the Latino community has to say or what environmentals has to say, but they may care a lot about small business owners. So let's bring in uh, small business owners to talk about what the importance of NEPA is. Uh, all of that has to resonate, right? And I can go on and on and on about the constituencies that, need, that Congress needs to hear from, but those are just a few examples uh, of what we can be do, or of what we can be doing at this point. And as I mentioned before, we need to give a, a name and a face to NEPA. If we say, oh, we're saving X amount of dollars, well, that's just that. That's just a talking point. But if we bring in people to tell their actual stories about how NEPA has affected them, how NEPA affected a project that was supposed to happen but now is not happening, or maybe it's happening in an improved way with safeguards for the community, all of those stories need to be told so that senators and representatives can use them as examples to highlight the importance of this law. Um, and as I mentioned, when NEPA goes well, when NEPA when, when NEPA's not followed and things go wrong, those are also good stories um, you know, to use uh, for this effort. Obviously, one of, one of the issues when, when things go awry, such as the dam in California, for example, right now, where they did all sorts of shortcuts in the in the Oroville Dam uh, when they were doing through the NEP, they were going through the NEPA process, and now that 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 dam's about to give, and it's really falling apart. You know, it's really unfortunate, but we need to make sure that that kind of stuff doesn't happen again, especially when we're about to pass a major infrastructure package in the Sen in the Senate and the House, uh, where we're going to be building a lot of these things. We need to make sure that they're actually done correctly, uh, if they're done at all. Uh, and finally and I think this is an important point, is really we have to hold those, even within our own champions, even within the Democratic Party or, you know, whether they be uh, independents or Democrats, whatever it may be, we need to hold them accountable whenever they don't vote the right way on these issues. You know, a lot of things we hear, well, it was a transportation bill. How was I supposed to say, you can't, I can't vote for a transportation bill if there are NEPA shortcuts, right? Everybody likes new roads. Everybody likes to fix the old roads. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna stop it because NEPA is in the way. So we need to make sure that people that care about NEPA actually hold uh, elected officials accountable and say, actually, we're not okay with that. This isn't gonna fly, and we're, you know, this is gonna cost you votes, and it's gonna cost you your jobs in the uh, in the end. So. And uh, when we're talking about, Stephen mentioned two types of attacks, right, that we see on NEPA. One is whenever, they, uh, whenever the attacks appear on must-pass legislation that's coming up. The other side, on the other uh, types of attacks are attacks that we see sort of on standalone bills that come, say, with regarding to pipelines or whatever it may be. But there are different strategies for each of these types of bills. Uh, so I'll start with the larger infrastructure packages. These are things, Stephen mentioned the budget. Uh, this is one example of them. There is also bound to be an infrastructure package that there has been a lot of hearings in Congress about already in which they want to fund all kinds of energy infrastructure like pipelines, but they also want to build transportation uh, infrastructure like roads, highways, whatever it may be. Um, and so those bills tend to be very popular. So if we do a vote count, and, and, and let me just be very upfront, right now the threshold in, the, um, in Congress is really in the Senate. The Republicans have a supermajority in the House, so it's not to say that we need to forget about the House, but, but usually, uh, usually it's much tougher to get, you would have to get a lot of Republican buy-in to stop something in the House. So we're really focusing on the Senate here. But on these, on these must-pass infrastructure packages, what usually happens is they're very popular because everybody gets something in their state, right? If it's an infrastructure package and I've been wanting to get that bridge funded for about 20 years now and it's finally going to get done, it's going to be very hard for me to vote against a package that finally funds that bridge if, uh, even if it has some NEPA cutbacks and I don't like NEPA cutbacks, right? So in those bigger infrastructure bills, the trick is to get the, ne the NEPA attack language out before the bill gets voted on, right? So what do we do with that? We like to work with committees. So, um, you know, in the structure of Congress, uh, 
and in both the House and the Senate, they say, all right, well, we're going to designate this subgroup of senators or this subgroup of representatives, and they're just going to deal with these kinds of issues. There are two committees that where NEPA attacks come up the most, right? And that's not to say that they don't come up in other areas, but these two committees get the most. And that's the, in the Senate is the Environment and Public Works Committee and the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Those committees are where we see the most NEPA attacks. And they say, well, we're, we're going to deal with just exactly what the title says, all those kinds of legislation, right? So what do we do there? There are top-ranked, uh, in each party, there is a top-ranked member that controls that committee. In EPW, in the Energy and Public Works Committee in the Senate, the ranking member, on the, the ranking member is the Democrat, the highest Democrat of rank in the committee, and that's Senator Carper from Delaware. He's key, and I'll come back to him in a few minutes. On, on the Republican side is Senator Barrasso from Wyoming, and, and he's really in to destroy NEPA. So we need to make sure that we hold them accountable. On, on the Environment, uh, on the Energy and Natural Resource Committee, the ranking member is Senator Cantwell from the state of Washington. Um, and the, 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 the chair, the top Republican on the committee, is Senator Murkowski from Alaska. So, those four figures are important because they control committee activity. They say when hearings are going to be called, and they, they say what legislation is going to be advanced out of committee. So in, in a world where you only have to make four phone calls in your entire year, you want, to make the, you want to make sure that those four phone calls go to these four people because they're key in moving legislation forward. So we need to attack committee because committee is usually the – Committee staff are usually the ones that are actually negotiating language on these bills, right? So you've heard, oh, this bill has been introduced. And really what that becomes is just a suggestion from a particular member of Congress that gets really tweaked a lot during the committee process and the markup in each committee of jurisdiction. So in this case, um, you know, in the infrastructure bill, we're going to see legislation move in both committees to try to eventually come through with this massive package on infrastructure that we're going to have to address. So we really need to work with staff sort of behind the scenes. Because even our friends, even people who say, hey, I'm very good on NEPA, I, I know I want to protect it, when they see it pinned against the transportation bill where they want to fund that bridge that they, really, they, they, that they were really yearning in the, for 20 years, they say, well, it's not worth it. I'm not going to throw myself under the bus because of NEPA stuff, right? So we don't have the political capital at this point to be able to say, well, NEPA is actually more important than any infrastructure package that you may have. While that may be the case for many of us, they just don't believe that yet. So we really have to work behind the scenes, making sure language is not damaged or, or, or taking language out and then let it, letting the bill ride and, and play its course, right? Once it plays its course and it, its course and it doesn't have NEPA attacks, then we're okay with it, uh, at least in some sense, unless it has some other uh, sort of environmental attack. Um, the strategy is different when we're talking about standalone bills. For standalone bills, they actually want to hit NEPA head on, right? And so they want to pass a pipeline bill and they say, oh, by the way, none of the, uh, NEPA, uh, NEPA actually doesn't apply to these pipelines that we're talking about. Well, that's a direct attack on NEPA. That's where our champions can actually come out swinging. And while we might try to kill the bill, we, we can actually try to kill the bill altogether and force a vote on it. And in most things in the Senate, for most things, not all things, but most things in the Senate require 60 votes. Republicans right now don't have 60 votes in the Senate. Okay, so, uh, so they need some Democrats to turn. Uh, and, and that's really where our strategy comes. Making sure that we hold the party line um, on these votes is, is key. So I'm going to give you a list of, uh, of key folks, and I'm going to tell you why they're key. I spoke, uh, I spoke about Senator Carper. He's the ranking member, the top Democrat, the one that, uh, at least on the Democratic side, what can have the most influence over the agenda in the, in the Environment and Public Works Committee, where a lot of this legislation is going to take place. You see his Twitter handle, you see his address, you see his phone, his phone number. Get in touch with them. Let them know, hey, we want to make sure that you protect NEPA in the long run. Um, if anybody's interested, I'll send out my email. We're trying to set up in-state meetings, actually in Delaware, 
where you guys that live in Delaware can actually talk to his office in Delaware and we'll conference in all the staff from DC so that you can have double the impact. So if anybody's interested in attending those meetings, please let me know. I'll send out my email address so people uh, can get in touch with me. Uh, so I also want to name uh, from New York, uh, Senator Schumer. Senator Schumer is the leader of the Democrats in the, in, in the Senate. And Senator Schumer controls what comes to, well, he doesn't control it, but he has the most influence in the Democratic Party about what comes to the floor and what doesn't. Usually Republicans could sort of bring up to the floor whatever they want, but Schumer is sort of the whip, the one that is the leader of the Democrats in the Senate. So he's, he's likely to, um, to be influential in whether some Democrats decide to vote against NEPA or for it. Um, I also mentioned Senator Cantwell, who, who's from Washington State, and again, she is essentially Carper's equivalent, but in the Energy and, Pub and Natural Resources Committee. Uh, in, uh, in Oregon, we have Representative DeFazio, and this is in the, in the House, right? So again, it requires a lot more effort to get a win out of the House, but uh, Senator DeFazio is the ranking member, the top Democrat in the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And with this infrastructure bill coming up, this is going to be key to make sure that uh, that no bad language gets added uh, to that bill. Finally, I want to point to the direction of the last, uh, the last three people on the slide. Senator Menendez is key, not really because of any committees of jurisdiction, but because of the caucus that he's in. He's, he's a member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which has a large membership, particularly in the House, and so he carries a lot of weight within there. Another big uh, champion of ours in the Senate is Senator Booker. He really cares about environmental justice. So anything that deals with, with that issue, he's usually a good vote and a good champion of. And Representative Pallone, I also wanted to include in there because he's also a ranking member of a committee in the, Senate, in the House that, uh, that has a lot of infrastructure uh, issues as well coming up in the next few weeks. So everybody asks me this all the time. I just added this slide because everybody asks me, so who are the problems and who are the swings, right? And so here you get a sense of who we are talking about, who we need to touch, who, who we need to get in contact the most, right? And you're going to see, you know, there are some problem senators that, that, you know, even within the Democratic Party, like Senator Manchin, that are just not voting the right way, have not voted our way um, almost entirely, right? So we need to make sure that we address that uh, uh, right away and that we hold him accountable hold him and everybody else on that list accountable for, for any votes against NEPA. On the, other, on the other column, you'll see sort of swings, right? And what I mean by swings, these are folks that have generally been good. They don't really try to go out and, and, and dismantle NEPA, but if, if they're forced into a vote, they will always throw NEPA under the bus first. And so you see the first person there is a problem, right? Because we've been talking a lot about Carper, and Carper has tremendous influence over this process, and he's also one of those swing senators that's not really out to get NEPA, but he's also not in to, to do it any favors, right? So he's quick to throw it under the bus if there are any other priorities coming up. Um, so I just want to point out that in, in that in in that slide we have two separate columns. Uh, the one on the left are sort of, I, I call them my problem senators, senators that don't really vote with us. The one on the second column is a list of, of folks who, if nothing else is at stake, would probably vote with us. But as soon as something, some other priority of theirs is in stake, then we have a problem with their vote. Uh, so finally, I want to give you some, uh, some resources. Uh, there is a, we just launched a new NEPA website within Earth Justice that I want you to take a look at. The link is right there. Um, it's earthjustice.org slash features slash NEPA. It goes through sort of what we've gone through in this, part, in this presentation, more of what NEPA is and how it's being attacked. And it also has a petition at the very end. Uh, we're hoping to get over 50,000 uh, signatures. Right now I think we're at about uh, 14 to 16,000. So please, uh, if you have a moment to spare and you care about the issue, please uh, go on and sign on. And what we'll do is that we'll print out all of these petitions and we'll send them directly to the senators on your, at, uh, on your state uh, to make sure that they hear from you uh, coming with you know, your address and your information so that they know that, it, that, that it's from you. Um, 
So I want to stop there. I, want, I definitely want to leave some time for questions. Uh, and I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Stephen and, and Maya and Bridget, uh, everybody at Delaware Riverkeeper for having us. And please let us know if there are any questions or if we can help with anything else regarding this issue. All right, thank you, Raul and Stephen. Um, it looks like we are having some problems with the chat box that usually works for us. We haven't been getting questions in, and I don't think people have been able to send them through. So I think what we're going to do, um, since it's also 7.30 now, is see if people could send any questions they have to Andrew. And his email address is andrew at delawareriverkeeper.org. And then he will include your questions as well as any answers from Stephen and Raul in the follow-up email that he'll be sending out shortly, um, hopefully tomorrow if possible. And then before we wrap up, I also just wanted to note another uh, relevant upcoming date or dates, um, March 22nd and 23rd, which is tomorrow and the next day, as well as April 5th and 6th, there will be call-in days to protect communities from frack gas pipeline, pipelines, compressors, and LNG exports. Um, and so right now, FERC can't approve any frack gas pipelines or LNG export facilities because they don't have the legal quorum necessary to cast binding votes. It only has two commissioners of the needed three. So until a new FERC commissioner is approved by the Senate, the agency cannot issue the certificates needed to approve frack gas pipelines, compressors, or LNG exports subject to its jurisdiction. So we're everyone to make six calls to tell your senators and the five members of the Energy and Natural Resource Committee to hold hearings to get to the bottom of FERC's abuses of power and address them before approving one more appointee to the commission. And you can find more information about this um, on our website, on our calendar page, as well as on our Facebook page. Um, Andrew will also be emailing all of the information out in the follow-up email, and it's also on a bunch of other co-organizers' pages as well that you may have seen. So I think with that, since it still doesn't look like the chat box, and we're sorry about that. We've never had that problem before. Yeah, so, so just remember to send any questions to Andrew, and that, again, is just andrew at delawareriverkeeper.org, and we will get, um, get as many as possible answered by Stephen and Raul and, and put that, include that information in the follow-up email. Um, I think with that, yeah, we're not going to be able to do questions, and we've come up against the hour, so I think that might be it. We just want to say... Thank you to Stephen and Raul, and we hope you guys can tune in for the rest of the webinar series coming up. Thank you, Bridget, and thanks, everybody, for attending this. And please, uh, Andrew can hopefully share my email address or Raul's, and if you have any questions, you can directly contact us as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. If you, if you want to share that, that would be fine, or we can just get them over to you. Sure. So I, I mentioned uh, uh, some of the meetings that we're trying to get in Delaware. If anybody's interested, my or, or if anybody has any questions, my, my email is rgarcia at earthjustice.org. So uh, again, it's rgarcia at earthjustice.org. Let me know if I can help in any way. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, guys. That was great. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.